people, some people listen, listening and watching. Um, I'm going to talk about really the evolution of the Tapping Reef House and the law school building and how architecturally it changed over time and a little bit about how we use it as a museum. But before I start that, I just want to, for anybody who doesn't know, the, just a real brief history of the law school so that what I'm talking about actually makes sense. Um, the law school was started by Tapping Reeve in 1774. Um, it's really the first professional school of law in the country. And what Reeve did that was different, he took students into his house first and then into the building on the bottom left that was the Litchfield Law School. He devised a series of lectures so that every student who came to him got basically the same information. The lectures evolved over the 40 year history of the school as the United States evolved and as the legal system in the United States evolved. And many of those students then had those notebooks bound and they became the basis of their law libraries. We'll talk a little bit about the notebooks at the, at the very end. Um, there were over a thousand young men. Um, I call it a partridge in a pear tree list. There were two vice presidents, three Supreme Court justices, 14 governors, over a hundred members of Congress. Um, and I think we've just, we figured out that 10% um, of the United States Congress in 1800 were graduates of the school. So they really had their hands in everything that happened in this country between 1800 and the Civil War. And they were on both sides of any kind of um, controversy or action that you can think of. That's another story. And maybe as this continues, um, I can do a, a talk on the history of the, of the law school, which is pretty fun and pretty interesting. But we're going to start with the house now. So what you see on the screen now is the, um, the Tapping Reef House on the upper right hand corner and the Litchfield Law School down here. And these are as they, as we see them today. This is a very early shot of the Tapping Reef House. And I'm not, we don't know exactly when it was taken. I'm going to say, you know, the 1870s probably or the early 1880s. And it is actually a, a similar construction to, to the way we see the house today with the, the four bays, two stories on the right hand side, and then a wing off to the left. The four bay house, the two story house was the original house that Reed built in 1774. And then the wing on the left was added to the house in 1784, which is the same year he actually built the law school building. Um, that room initially, originally was used as a, a downstairs bedroom for his wife, Sally Burr-Reeve, who was Aaron Burr's sister, and that's a whole other story, um, who was something of an invalid, and pro by providing a downstairs bedroom, she didn't have to have to climb stairs, and she could also become part of the life of the school and, um, and the community. And then the house passed out of the Reeve family in the 1830s. 40s and um, was owned by the Woodruff family here in, in Litchfield and they made some pretty significant, oops, sorry, significant changes to the house. Um, the house on the left, you can still see the original four bays on the right hand side, but on the left hand side you can see that the one story addition was actually raised into a two story addition and the front porch was run along the whole house. They made a lot of significant changes to the interior of the house at the same time, and um, we'll see some of those as we go through. On this side, you can see that there, so this is the, the one-story wing that became a two-story wing, and then over here, there was another um, wing that was added to the back of the house that is also also two stories. So that's where we, we were in the 1890s, um, 1900. I include this slide just because I love it so much. We call it the ghost slide. Um, and we don't know who she is or what that is, but it's another shot of the house where you can see that the, the property was much more overgrown, um, much more planted than it is today. You can see the wing off the back and we're still, we're still with the two-story addition here. And switch a little bit quickly to the law school. The law school, as I said, was built in 1774. 1784, sorry, um, next to the house. And when the house passed out of the Reed family and when the school closed, the law school moved all over town. This is one of my favorite shots. And this is probably um, in the late 18th, late 19th, early 20th century. The house, the, the excuse me, the law school was moved. Ah, excuse me. And this is another um, artist's conception of that moving early on. Um, and in this 
if, it, if this timing is right, this was before the fires in the 1880s, but the house, the law school was moved down South Street and down, um, down West Street and became attached to one of the houses on West Street. And it was, it was an office in this house for, for a number of years. Um, and it got clearly Victorianized and um, has lots of nice um, additions of, um, there's a name for it, but it's not coming to me, um, of Victorian adornment on, on the building. Gingerbread, there we go, gingerbread on this house. But then in 1914, um, the law school was, the law school building was given to the historical society and it was moved to the side lawn. So this is the side, the, the back of the historical society. This is what's the antique shop right now. Um, and it was placed on that lawn and you can't read the sign in this, um, in this slide, but it was actually a, a woman's dress shop. And it was operated as a dress shop for a number of years until the um, woman who ran the dress shop had a, a pot belly stove in the building and caught fire. And um, the building was not damaged, but at that point the, um, the, it was no longer used as a dress shop and it was just next to the historical society building. And then in 1929, um, the, um, the last Woodruff passed away and he left the house and law school to Yale University. Yale didn't want it. And so we bought it from Yale. And then we put together, uh, we, the historical society, I wasn't there at the time, put together a group of people to raise money to restore the house and the law school. And that, um, that committee was headed by William Howard Taft, um, who at that point was um, on the Supreme Court. So it was a, a really distinguished group of people and they were able to really at the beginning of the depression raise enough money to, to move the law school back to its original proper to its original location um, next to the house. This is another shot of it moving. And they um, <clears throat> rebuilt the law school on the property. And this is a shot in, in the 1930s of the, the law school committee laying the cornerstone and moving, moving the law school back to the Reeve property. This gentleman in the raccoon coat um, and if you're from Litchfield and you know, um, this was Mitchell Van Winkle's father. Um, and he was at that point, the president of the, of the historical society. And this is a, the distinguished committee of people. And they're, they're down here as well. And you can see that the um, dress shop sign is still on the building, but eventually they managed to take that off. And then um, in the 1950s and 60s, they, um, the Historical Society put a garden in the front of the law school. And this um, slide helps you see that the law school is actually much further back on the property than it is today. Um, that is where they, where they originally thought it was. This um, quite elaborate garden was installed. It's called the Howe Memorial Garden. The Howe family gave us um, funds to, to build the garden. And then in, 1976, we did a bicentennial project. Oops, sorry, skipped a slide. Um, we're going to go back to the house for a minute. So at the same time, this is the original shot of the house with the with the addition. This is then the two story addition, and then we in the 1930s um, took the second story off and um, essentially restored the addition to its original configuration. Except we didn't really, because if you look at this shot. You can see the um, the tall windows here, and we put normal normal size um, traditional colonial colonial windows here. These windows were really interesting. It's possible that Reeve and Sally, because Sally was was not well, really thought that light and air were 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 good for her. So the windows were definitely oversized. It's possible that this helped give her. Um, a connection to the community and a con connection to the law school students because the law school is just right here. So students will be walking back and forth. We really don't know why, but it's a, it's a very interesting configuration and it was not continued in the 1930s. So the interior of the house then was res restored as really it's what we consider today a colonial revival interior. It was what the people in the 1930s thought a colonial house should look like. It didn't necessarily reflect what a colonial house actually looked like. And in fact, the, um, the Woodruff family in 
when they were living in the house had changed the house considerably, changed the, the, the footprint of the interior. They moved walls and enlarged rooms and did things like that. So the house wasn't really, when, when the historical society got a hold of it, it wasn't really the same interior um, layout as the house had been when Reeve was there. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. But for instance, this room, um, the historical society called the keeping room and possibly it was intended to be, to be the kitchen. Um, we do know that the paneling in this room was moved from another house into the Reeve house in the thirties. So it's not original to the house. And, um, and that the kitchen probably was a small, a smaller building actually attached to the back of the house as, and which would have been torn down in the 1890s when the addition was put on the back of the house. We had, uh, skip ahead a little bit, in the 1990s, we had an architectural survey done of the house. So from the, um, the beams in the basement and the, and the structure behind the walls, they were really able to determine, not completely, but closely what, that, what the house would look like. And this was not a kitchen. There would have been a, a much larger central fireplace in the, in the house originally that, would have, that was taken out when the, um, when the Woodruffs um, moved in. They also did in the 1930s, um, it's actually beautiful stenciling in the front hall going, going up the stairs. It's based on the early 19th century um, figures and, and, and stenciling, but it, but it was done in the 1930s. And then we have some of the rooms. So this room is, um, was set up as a dining room but it of the Reeve period, but it is was actually in the 1890s edition. So it was never a dining room during the Reeve during the Reeve's time there. Um, this room upstairs was set up as a children's room. Um, Tappy Reeve and Sally had one child, so there was a there was a child in the house um, at some point. But um, he was a boy, and it doesn't mean he couldn't play with dolls. But the room wasn't as completely accurate as it could have been for. Um, for what actually happened with the family. And then you can't really see this, but um, this is the, so this is, this is the addition, the Sally um, bedroom addition that was put on in 1784. So you can see that the windows are um, traditional windows. There's a bed here. It's quite a large room. And I think this is actually interpreted correctly that the room would have been a sitting room for Sally as well as a bedroom. So it's much larger than a bedroom would have been during that time period. And this is um, the front room or the parlor, which was a smaller room in the original, in the original house. And then the, the Woodruffs opened it up so it ran the full length of the house. But in any case, we did restore it and we did furnish it as a historic house museum of the, the vision of a historic house museum in the 1930s. And this is one of the, um, the, the flyers or signs for the, for the opening of the Reef House. It was open Wednesdays, Wednesday mornings and afternoons, Sunday, mor Sunday afternoons, the emission was 25 cents. And, um, it just, and it shows some of the pictures of, this is another, another upstairs bedroom. So it's pretty, pretty fun um, museum for its time. In, in 1976, um, we had some funding and we did a bicentennial project, which um, was an archaeological exploration of the side yard of the Reeve House, which determined that the law school was indeed not way back on the property with that garden in front of it, but it was actually right on top of the garden. So um, that garden was dismantled and um, we actually partnered with the Litchfield Garden Club to, to change the garden and to move the um, to move the law school. So the law school moved forward and um, we talked, I think there was a question yesterday about the garden around the house and the law school. And that's the point we hired a landscape designer to redesign the Howe garden. So the garden that's around the house and law school now technically is the Howe, is the Howe garden. And um, as I said last week, I hope that we're gonna be able to restore that to its, to the um, 1976 version of what the what a historic garden around a house may have looked like. So this is the house today. Um, you can see on the right hand side here, this is the addition that goes back in the back. Um, and it is open as well, it will be I hope soon open as a museum, it's not open right now. So we um, 
as I talked about last week in the late 80s, early 90s, we renovated the Litchfield History Museum and put new exhibits in it. And when that was finished, it became really clear that um, it was also time to do some renovation at the law school and to think about the interpretation down there. Historic house museums are terrific, um, and there are great historic house museums in Connecticut, and honestly, this was not one of them. Um, it was, when you have a historic house museum, you're, you're, tied to a, you're tied to a period and a pretty specific story of the house, and we realized that the story we wanted to tell was the story of the law school. And as we decided how to tell the story of the law school, we decided it was the story of the students and the people who were involved. So we um, dismantled the historic house museum part of the house. We didn't architecturally change the house in any way. So if ever somebody wants to put it back, it, it can go back. But, um, but we, we sort of refocused on the school itself and who the students were, where they came from, what they, what they learned when they came here, the people in the community that they interacted with and what they did when they left. So this is an addition that we put on um, to the building at that time and this is the introduction, introductory gallery. And this little piece here, I wish I had a slide of it, is um, shows the original floor plan of the house superimposed over the floor plan that shows all of the changes over the years. So you can see the difference between the original house and, um, and the house the way, the way it is today. As I said, we, we, we decided that the way to look at this was to focus on the people, um, on the men who taught and the men who attended, and actually the women who attended the Litchfield Female Academy because the two schools were so closely tied. So these are what we call traveling papers. And when you come to visit the museum, every visitor is given a traveling paper and you then tour the museum as a student. And um, the traveling papers help you move from room to room, from exhibit to exhibit. And if, um, it, for instance, you are um, John C. Calhoun, and with your traveling paper, if there's something about you, a quote from you, an image of you, a letter from you, which we have in the, in the exhibit, your traveling papers will direct you to the information about you, so that it gives a much more personal touch to the, um, to the actual story. And this is um, a trunk where we have um, on travel on traveling tickets so students came from um, all over the country 13 states and ter territories Canada and the West Indies and the, their travel was different depending on where they came from so these little guys are um, travel tickets from different parts of the country and the ticket will tell you what your travel was like to get here travel was dangerous it was long and the point of that is to show that um, if people were going to go through the travel that they did there was, they, they did it for a reason, that there was something here for them. Oops. And then um, we move into the house itself, and this is an introductory gallery. This is another trunk where you can take money and learn a little bit about the monetary system at the time. You can, um, you can write home here. You can find out if your money is counterfeit. You can write, home, write a letter home here asking for money and telling why you need it. And in this area, you, you meet the men of the sort of prominent men of the community and the prominent women of the community, led by Sarah Pierce, who was the head of the Litchfield Female Academy. In this space, we move into Tapping Reeves office and you learn more about the, the school day and what the students were learning. And in this space, um, we really start to talk about um, other things that were happening in the community and the way, um, the way pol particularly the way politics was important to the students the students here, excuse me, it's my face is on it and my screen. Um, so this, this is the Liberty Tree, how to grow a party system. And we tried, we talk a lot about the politics of the period, which is right in here. But this shows sort of how, um, how we grew from no political parties at all to the Democrat and Republican parties that we have today and all the different offshoots that happened over the course of time. It's kind of a fun graphic and it's, we, we use it because politics were very, very important to these, to these folks. And we actually know um, for almost all of the students that we have traveling papers for what their political affiliation was. So these are Federalist and Anti-Federalist tickets which you pick up as you're going through the house depending on the politics of your student. And it basically shows in a very um, condensed and simple way, as simple as we could make it, what the difference is between the beliefs of those two to um, two parties were. And then finally you move into 
um, what we call the balance of your life. And this is what you did when you left Litchfield. And you can really learn a, a lot in here. These guys were amazing and they did amazing things. And that's detailed here in this, um, in this space. And then the law school itself, um, there were, over, as we said, over a thousand young men who, who studied here. These are reproductions of original, um, original desks and benches. Um, some, some of the notebooks are reproduced here. And it's, a, it's a, an interesting, um, it's an interesting space to think about the kind of learning that was happening. As I mentioned, the house had been, the law school had been moved and moved and rebuilt and moved. And, um, and really what we have today is a rebuilding. And these, these um, beams with the white paint are parts of the original building and the rest of it is really essentially rebuilt. We use it for um, interesting, we try and do, do as many things with it as we can. And we've had some wonderful opportunities in the last couple of years. A couple of years ago, the Connecticut Appellate Court actually came to the building and held, held hearings in the, in the building. We did two. Um, it was filmed by um, Connecticut Television. We had students um, who, who watched it and um, interacted with the judges when it was over. It was a really fabulous, it was a fun, fun day. And I think the judges enjoyed it as much as we did. It's a really, it's a wonderful space to be in for something like that. Um, we do a lot of programming with schools. This is just one example. It's a little eighth grade from a couple of years ago, doing a federalist and anti-federalist debate. So they're in, they're in the law school debating here and they're in the um, exhibit working on, working on their positions down there. We also had, I believe Taft School and Taft and Hotchkiss debate teams came and held debates in the law school. It's just a, it's a wonderful space to do that kind of um, activity in. We also have some distinguished visitors occasionally. This, I try not to look at my hair, but look at this guy, um, who is Justice Kennedy. So he came, he and his wife came to Lachille for a wedding and um, visited the law school with us, actually the museum and the law school. And he spent about two and a half, three hours with us, really talking about um, legal issues and legal education, the differences between what was happening then and what was happening today. It was a really delightful, delightful day. We use the students in lots of different ways, the information on the students. This is a database called the Litchfield Ledger, and it's a database of students at the law school and the female academy. It's searchable, you can find it on the front page of our website. And it will tell you, um, a bio, it will give you a biography as much as we know about individual students. And it will also link if we, if we know where their papers are, or if we know if we have portraits of them, or, with the girls at the Female Academy, if there's needlework or watercolors or other artwork that they did, that will all be listed down here and, and linked. Um, I have to say, I just yesterday um, submitted an app, a grant application to the National Endowment for the Humanities to update this because it is now 10 year old technology. And I guess technology moves at the speed of light and historical societies don't. So we need to do some rebuilding of the ledger to make it work. Um, better and more efficiently. So I'm hoping that we're going to be able to do that. And I mentioned the law school notebooks earlier. Um, we have, I don't know, 60 ish notebooks in our collection. The, the Yale Law School has, has a, a few more than we do. And a few years ago, the Yale, you know, the folks at the law library contacted us and said that they had a grant to digitize all of their notebooks and wondered if we would like to have ours done too. Well, we thought, yes, that would not be a bad idea. So um, Yale yeah, was terrific and they did a project and all the notebooks are digitized. They're all now online in this site at the Yale Law School and the, the notebooks link to the ledger. So if you're interested in if you're looking at the notebooks and you're interested in a particular student it will link back to the ledger so that it's a nice collaboration with Yale and in the years since the notebooks have been up and the ledger has been up we've really been privileged to work with some young emerging scholars who have completed PhD dissertations and books and are now teaching so this, they're going to help us get the story out to, to a wider audience so that's where we are with with the law school and I hope um, maybe if people are interested, I'll come back and do a whole talk on the law school and the female academy, which is kind of fun. You'll learn a lot more about who the students were and what their and their stories, because it, really it's about the people's stories, and that's what what I love to do. Um, we are changing our format a little bit in the in the coming weeks. Um, we have a, a special 
project program that we're looking at um, relating to Benjamin Talmadge. And um, if you're on our if you're on our mailing list or you follow us on social media, you'll get some information about that. Um, so we're we're moving to um, Benjamin all Benjamin Talmadge all the time for the next little while. But we're looking at him in lots of different ways and from different from different from different perspectives. So um, I hope you'll learn more about that and you'll continue to join us for Coffee with the Curator and the other programs we do. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kathy. That was great. Uh, we'll let everyone take a moment to uh, maybe fill in the question and answer and see if anyone has any questions for you. Um, also to point out in the chat, uh, Linda Hawking, our archivist, um, put a nice quote about when Justice Kennedy visited. Um, so also make sure you take a look at that as well. And since I, I do have the floor right now, maybe I'll ask a question um, or more of a comment is I, I always find it really interesting when looking at the law school that the door changes sides. Ah, yeah, so um, I, I don't know at what point it moved from the left to the right, um, but when, um, when they actually looked at the structure of the building in, in the last or second to last move, they realized that the original door had been on the left, so they, they, they moved it back over. It's amazing when you um, look at old houses and old buildings, how many changes there were and, and the different ways the, the buildings were structured. And that's a little tiny building and yet it had many, many changes to it over time. And we found the same thing with the, with the, um, with the house itself. There were lots and lots of changes. And that's one of the reasons that we knew we couldn't bring it back to the original house because we knew there were changes, but we really didn't know what the interiors, the interiors looked like. So rather than do another guess at what a historic interior looked like, that was part of the reason that we felt comfortable um, really moving the exhibit to an interpretive exhibit to talk about the school itself and the students. Of course. Uh, let's see. It doesn't look like we have any questions so far. Um, give it maybe oh, just well. another moment or so. Uh, also to remind people that on a Wednesday, we'll be having our first of a new series uh, called Letters and Libations. And we'll be having a local historian, uh, Pete Vermilier, will be talking about um, one of his favorite letters um, and kind of that impact that it has. Uh, so make sure to check that out. We'll be posting the link to join that on Zoom uh, today and tomorrow again. And Kathy, I think you did a, 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 such a good job that most of the questions people had must have been answered. No problem. Um, that's a great, great thing to have sometimes. And uh, otherwise, besides that, Kathy, thank you for doing this today. Thank you. It was great fun. See you all soon, I hope. Thank you, Kathy. Bye-bye.